This deals with making distance sampling work. The idea that we're going to talk about is that all statistical methods are based upon assumptions. And so we need to discuss those assumptions and understand how we can make them, how we can make our field methods live up to the assumptions that our an analytical methods assume. We've talked about distance sampling being a two-stage method, so there are assumptions attached to each of those stages. The first stage was to try to estimate the number of objects inside a covered region. That's what we termed N sub A with the hat on it. The trick associated with estimating N sub A is to estimate P sub A. Having an estimate of N sub A, we need to figure out how to scale up from the portions of the study area that we sampled to the portions of the study area that we did not sample. And that is the conversion from N sub A to N hat without the A. We have quite a few assumptions associated with estimating and hat sub A. The first one is the one that trips up many people, and it is one that says animals are dist distributed independently of the places that we sample. If that assumption is true, when that assumption is true, it allows us to know how the animals are distributed with respect to our line or point transects. Using a line transect example for a moment, we'll notice that if the animals are distributed independently of the transect, there is just there are just as many animals in the region between 4 and 6 meters away from the transect as there are between 0 and 2 meters. Therefore, the drop-off in the number of sightings that we have as a function of distance is attributable exclusively to the detection function. That's what we want to have happen. Now, how can we make that go wrong? We can make that go wrong by not placing our transects randomly in our study area. If we don't place our transects randomly in the study area, then this assumed horizontal line that says there are just as many animals a long ways away from our transects as there are animals nearby our transects if that's not true, we can end up with considerable bias in our estimates, so don't do that. We also assume that animals right on our transect are estimated with certainty. And it's a direct consequence. The degree to which that assumption is violated leads to, an ex to exactly the same degree of downward bias or underestimation of population size. We're still trying to do a good job of estimating N sub A, and the third assumption associated with that is that the observation process happens instantaneously. It's a snapshot. We know that we can't literally have a snapshot, except in very strange circumstances. So what we do want to do is we want to be able to at least try to detect the animals before they detect us, which also implies that we, as the observers, are moving a lot faster than the animals who are going about their daily business.
what happens as a result of the movement of animals in their normal course of activities when conducting line transect sampling is that the animals are more likely to be detected as they move toward us than they are likely to be detected as they move away from us. What does that do? That tends to skew the detection function so that it falls away more rapidly than it really should. By having it fall away more rapidly than it really should, that area under the curve relative to the area under the rectangle, going back to the first lecture, is actually smaller than it ought to be, implying that our estimate of P is smaller than it ought to be. The estimated value of P appears in the denominator of our equation for estimating n sub a. So if p sub a is too small, then what we end up with is this positive bias in our estimate of n sub a. This is particularly acute when working with point transect methods because the observer is not moving at all. So any movement by the animals leads to potential detection of animals as they come towards you and missing of animals as they move away from you. That's bias caused by animal movement when the animals are not paying attention to you. They're just moving in their normal course of events. Now, if animals are moving as a result of being disturbed by the observers, then the consequences that I mentioned previously can be exacerbated. You can have movement of animals along a transect or moving from one transect to another. Obviously, if you drive animals so that you repeatedly see them on successive points or lines, you'll have even greater positive bias than before. When we talk about point transect sampling later, we'll talk about this snapshot and recognize that movement of animals that takes place not while you're, while you're attempting to record their locations is not a problem. Another assumption associated with trying to do a good job of estimating N sub A is that you measure distances correctly. Now you would think that if you, sometimes you overestimate and sometimes you underestimate, those things ought to cancel one another out. That's not necessarily the case. Even if you have random errors, you create bias. And that bias is a most considerable problem for you when you have errors in small distances when you round. Rounding is a problem. We also would like to assume in trying to do the best job we can of estimating N sub A that the detections are independent of one another. Now this has long been held as a very important assumption. Recent work by Professor Buckland has indicated that that is not a terribly important assumption to have. 
as I've noted here on the slide, if you violate independence of animal detections, there's actually very little consequence of that in the overall estimate of abundance. There are some knock-on effects in that model selection might be damaged, and things like AIC might not behave quite as we assume. But other than that, detections need not necessarily be independent.